about the rules of the Zoom webinar that we're gonna have today. Uh, today, we're gonna kind of do it in a different way. Uh, um, so I wanna thank you, Cree Novel, for that welcoming. Cree Novel is a graduate assistant for the Egan office. My name is Daniela Tabar again. I am a senior student of um, DePaul University. I'm currently doing elementary education. I'm from Colombia. So I'll be going over a few uh, housekeeping notes with you all over our Zoom event that and how this is going to work. I want to remind everyone that today we will be discussing issues and that every that everyone will have a different perspective on the issue. I invite you to actively listen and reflect on your own experience with this topic. Carlos Flores will be asked to reflect on your own, um, I'm sorry, Carl will be asked uh, a series of questions for 45 minutes before we turn it over to you, the audience. At the bottom of the screen is a chat function that allows you all uh, to type any question that you have for Carlos. Cree and I will be, will be reading these questions out loud for him to answer. Lastly, we want to give you a friendly reminder that your microphone should be off this whole event. Thank you for coming for this, um, to this event and we hope you enjoy. Thank you, Daniela. Um, we just want to talk a little bit more about the Egan Office before we begin. Um, the Egan Office of Urban Education and Community Partnerships continues to provide a platform for community voices and a catalyst for change in Chicago's most disadvantaged communities. The Egan Office has a rich history of integrating academic excellence with authentic community engagement. Our students are situated front and center on the critical issues confronting our schools and grapple with the ideal of social justice in those spaces. From our veterans project to the school-based initiatives, we strive to negotiate an intentional, systematic, and transformative university community approach that would achieve community identity outcomes. The Egan Office formula for university community engagement follows in the path of Monsieur John J. Egan and John McKnight's approach to community engagement. The activist role that embodied Father Egan confronted unjust systems while at the same time connected the dots to create an impact particular in communities of color. McKnight's asset-based approach recognizes that real community building starts from identifying the strengths and gifts that are already exist in the community. We will now be viewing one of the creators of this event, Amy Acosta's video introducing Carlos Flores. Now we're gonna play um, a video of Amy. Uh, she was the one who actually, um, we started it, this project because of her. Uh, unfortunately, she's not able to be here today, but we told her in advance to, group, uh, to record herself so she can give us a message about uh, this project. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Acosta and I'm a program coordinator here at the Egan. Um, so before we introduce the extraordinary, the legend, Mr. Carlos Flores, I would like to give out a few special shout outs. Um, so the first one will be uh, towards Miss Alexandria Johnson, who is our social media specialist. Thank you so much for organizing this event uh, and promoting the event through different uh, platforms um, on social media. Thank you so much for your help on that. I also want to give a special shout out and thank you to Miss Kareem Noble, who is our coordinator here at the Egan office, and Miss Dangana Tawar. Um, she is also our tutor with Our Lady of Tepeyac. You've all been incredibly wonderful and just amazing. And without your support, your contribution and collaboration, this would not have been uh, possible. I would also like to give a special shout out to Dr. Monica Ramos, who is our assistant director of the Egan office. And last but not least, our director of the office, John Siegler. Thank you so much for your help and your support throughout this. Um, so, Carlos Flores, <laughs> where do we begin with Carlos Flores? Um, I just wanna say, first and foremost, we are uh, extremely grateful and honored uh, that you are here as our guest speaker. And I unfortunately was not able to make it to the event today, but I just wanna say thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your story. It's a little about Carlos, right? Um, 
So Carlos Flores was born in Guayama, Puerto Rico, and has lived in Chicago since his arrival in 1959 at the age of 10. He earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in elementary education and a master's degree in criminal justice from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has a track record of community and cultural activism in Chicago's Latino community that stems from a period that began in the late 1960s to the present. As a member of the Young Lords organization in the late 1960s, he became involved in the battle against gentrification in the Lincoln Park community. He was also a student activist in the Latino student movement at the University of Illinois in Chicago during the late, during the 1970s. In the 1980s, he worked in the enforcement of civil rights law with the Federal U.S. Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. In the late 1980s, he served as the administrator of the Personnel Affirmative Action Program at the Chicago Public Schools. In the mid-1990s, he served as the coordinator of Project Kalinda at the Center for Black Music Research at Columbia College, Chicago. This project examined the relationships of African influenced music throughout the region of the Americas. In 2002, he was a contributor for the 848 radio program on Chicago's public radio station, WBEZ. Over the last three decades, Mr. Flores has served as a board member in various community and political organizations in Chicago, including Chicago History Museum, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Jazz Institute of Chicago, Erie Neighborhood House, Mayor Washington's Advisory Commission on Latino Affairs, Humboldt Park Vocational Center, Office of the Puerto Rican Community Affairs, and others. Mr. Flores is one of the founders of the Puerto Rican Arts Alliance, and in 1998, he initiated and coordinated the National Puerto Rican Cuatro Festival. He is also, well, he's also responsible for establishing the first Chicago Puerto Rican Community Chorus and the Chicago Afro Latino Institute. In 2006, he founded the Puerto Rican Triple Construction, Triple Construction Workshop with the objective of rescuing from extinction one of Puerto Rico's oldest string instruments. As a photographer and author, Mr. Flores has exhibited his foot photographs throughout Chicago, and his images have been published and featured in books, magazines, academic journals, and documentaries, including a photo exhibition at Water Tower Gallery in 2003. His works in Radical, Radicals in Black and Brown, Palante, People's Power, and Common Cause in the Black Panthers and Young Lords Organization was featured at the Stone Center for Black Culture and History in the University at the University of North Carolina. There were also photo essays that have been published in a central journal, Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College in New York City and the Alogo magazines at the Center for Latino Research at DePaul University, the book titled The Afro-Latino Latina Writer, Reader, History and Culture in the United States. His photographs have also been featured in film documentaries, films, and other local news segments. Back in 2008, the gangling program on the History Channel um, and the documentary um, titled Maniac Disciples has been featured on the History Channel, as well as Chicago's Puerto Rican history. In the fall 2019, Mr. Flores images have been featured in a documentary entitled The First Rainbow Coalition, a book on the history of Latin music in New York City by Professor Benjamin Lapidus. Mr. Flores is one of the founders and currently serves as the artistic director of the Chicago Latin Jazz Festival, sponsored by the Jazz Institute of Chicago and the Chicago Park District. So without further ado, I would like for you all to join me in welcoming Mr. Carlos Flores. Thank you, that was pretty long. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a great introduction from Amy. Um, so we have here like a little bit, um, a little bit of uh, summary. <laughs> All what you said, this is great. Um, you are like, a, it's a great honor to have you here right now. Um, in order to start uh, this conversation and one of the following questions that we're going to be starting this, um, I know there are a couple of people, um, there are like two classes actually, one from Mexico and one from Colombia. Here, 
So that's why we wanna we wanted just to kind of give them a little bit background about Chicago, Illinois, and specifically Lincoln Park in this case, because that's gonna be our next question, our following question. Um, in this case, we have um, something called gentrification. Um, and this is something that we have been talking uh, a lot during this quarter with the, uh, within the Egan office. Um, here are some pictures of Lincoln Park specifically in 1948 and now in 2020. And furthermore, I would like to ask you if it will be possible for you to discuss, um, I'm really sorry, I cannot read right now, <laughs> to discuss your memory of living in Lincoln Park before, during, and after gentrification. How do you define gentrification in this case and your fly during these moments? Well, it's a full load of question. I, I think that um, growing up in Lincoln Park was really a great experience because of the fact of growing up in a really true integrated community. Uh, because again, um, growing up there, you know, as a young man, I remember uh, my first uh, living uh, situation was living in in a, in a street called on LaSalle and Superior. Superior is a block south of Chicago Avenue, which is kind of close to the Gold Coast. And there were a lot of Puerto Ricans, like the uh, street after east of, um, of LaSalle is Clark Street. And Clark Street was one of those uh, centers where there were a lot of Puerto Ricans living there, like in the late 1950s. There's a lot of taverns, a lot of shops. So my family lived there, we lived there in a, in a you know, three flat uh, right in the corner there. Then from there, we moved to 1714 North Larrabee. Uh, and we lived there for several years. And then in 1966, my dad and my mom, they were like the first, one of the first families that purchased a, a building property in Lincoln Park. And so uh, we, uh, we bought a building at, uh, at 1128 West Armitage where, where I, I grew up most of my adolescence and my young, uh, <clears throat> young adult. So yeah, I, I've uh, experienced a lot in that community. As a matter of fact, I tell people that I'm a baseball fanatic. I played baseball since Little League all the way to like, to, you know, till I was 40, 45 years old. And then I just kind of gave it up. The body gave up, but I was a baseball, I was a baseball fanatic. And I, <clears throat> I tell people that I was like the Jackie Robinson of the old town Little League, because I was like the first black Puerto Rican kid that played in the all white, Little League team, and I think this is like 1960-61, and I, I still remember I was the only black kid playing, the only black Puerto Rican kid playing baseball there. But growing up in that community was kind of interesting because of the fact that it was not only a community uh, where people knew each other, it was kind of like a village kind of a thing, especially moving into Lincoln Park, uh, living on Armitage and also living on Larrabee Street. There was a community where there was a lot of people and, and a lot of people, everyone knew each other. It was kind of like an interesting thing where people look out for each other. And it was, it was kind of fun growing up. Now, back in those days, uh, as a young man, there was also a lot of social support centers. You know, there used to be, there was a YMCA on North Avenue. It was called the Eichstrom YMCA on North Avenue in Ogden. There was a, a, the Lincoln Boys Club, which is on Orchard and Willow. And then there was also the Arnold, uh, up on the Arnold Park District, which is right across the street from Waller, which is today Lincoln Park. So there was always a lot of the support centers for young people to go to for us. And we we uh, had, you know, all of us had, you know, different uh, groups of people that would hang out. So I, I belong to a group called the Continentals, right? Uh, there was a group called the Young Lords. There was a group called the Paragons. There was a group called the Black Eagles. And, you know, we used to self-identify, you know, by having these sweaters, right? That was the way that you would identify yourself. And then, you know, a lot of people, you know, I call them clubs, a lot of people call them gangs, but uh, it became also a situation where we actually organized ourselves because of the, you know, protecting ourselves because of the, the rivalry that would be there in terms of being attacked by other non-Puerto non Rican groups, you know, like uh, there, there, there's a, there was a little piece of joint right there by DePaul University, right in the corner of Webster, in Sheffield, it was called Roma's Pizza. And that's where the Roma boys would hang out. And those are the guys, the Italian guys that we would have to be very careful. So, you know, it was kind of like walking to a maze. You had to make sure you were not in the wrong neighborhood or at the wrong place. Until after a while, you know, we, uh, 
overpopulated and kind of took over the neighborhood in, in a way. But uh, those are kind of kind of the things that 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 I remember growing up growing up in. in the, uh, again, you know, families knowing each other, growing up in Lincoln Park on Armitage, and uh, it was it was a great situation because of the fact that. Uh, and I say it's a village because of the fact is, you know, like for example, if if I was doing something wrong and Don Luis would see me, he would tell me, you ain't supposed to be doing that. I'm gonna tell your dad when I see him and you could bet your bottom dollar that when my dad came home, he says, I just spoke to Don Luis and Don Luis said you were doing this. And so, you know, you're you're punished or, you know, I will get a cocotazo. A cocotazo means, you know, I hit you over the head with the knuckle. Uh, that's the way, you know, I mean, I. A lot of people talk about, you know, you don't do any physical uh, striking against children, against family. But back in the days, you know, the belt, you know, chancleta and the gocodazos work really well in terms of making sure that you didn't do it again. So I don't know if that kind of gives you an idea of what the neighborhood looked like. But uh, again, it was a very vibrant situation living on Armitage between Halstead and all the way to Racine. That whole strip was like, very big, you know, very vibrant. There was a lot of stores. There was like a uh, couple of record shops. Uh, one of the record shops was called uh, Rosario's uh, Record Shop, which is on Sheffield and Armitage. And as a matter of fact, one of Rosario's daughter just actually got, uh, I think she just actually uh, won her second term as a judge. So we had, you know, we had a lot of uh, families that, that came out of, you know, young people that came out of those families that really have done well in life, you know? So, so you know, I, I think that um, there was a lot of families that, that there was people that perished, but there was a lot of more family, families that actually made it through and, and did fine. And that's why, you know, I also feel that, uh, you know, those families, like people like my parents and my grandparents who actually left Puerto Rico, like in the mid 1940s to come here and leave their beautiful island to come here and, uh, and not to know what to expect and to, you know, to actually experience the worst because not only do you experience, you know, different winter, you know, different situation in terms of environment, but also they were not really welcome, but, you know, welcome as uh, citizens that we were uh, back in the mid 1940s. You know, they fit a lot, of, a lot of racism, a lot of exclusion. And with all those struggles and all the, those sacrifices, you know, families did well, you know, they, you know, our parents provided for us, but we actually took advantage of it. And many of us, you know, became first time, you know, college, you know, students, college graduate, and we did well. And, uh, and to me, those are, are real heroes in our community. I, I get really upset with, uh, with the idiots that we have in our community that go around naming streets after baseball, millionaire baseball players that were not even born in our city and not even raised in our city but they get a street name after because of the fact that they were part of a World Series team. And in reality, I had not yet seen a plaque or kind of anything that they would say that here are our real heroes. Our hero heroes are our parents and our grandparents who sacrificed so much. But again, I, I don't want to go off the, the, the tail. So I'm hoping that that kind of give you a, an idea of what the neighborhood be, is like. Yeah, no, and that helped a lot. Like, actually, you gave us like perfect description of all like what we were looking for. Um, right now, we're just kind of showing some pictures about the moment and a poster uh, that we found like in a research library from the poll. But I wanted to ask you, this is like an extra question that I just, I have right now. And it will be, how do you think the activism from the young lords or like a specific memory um, that you remember from that part when you were fighting against justification in um, in Lincoln Park. Well, you know it's interesting because I think I think it's it's it's, uh, it's all historical. I mean, I think it's the timing of of the you know of what was going on. You know, I think a lot of us you know were not even thinking about college. What the hell is that? A lot of us you know with uh, I mean, I remember and I still I have pictures of my young sisters when they were like. They used to go to a school up in the, when they used to, we used to live on the side of Superior. I'm trying to think of, you know, the school is in Orleans, but uh, there were there were like class pictures. And in those pictures, you saw the Latino kids, right? Uh, Puerto Ricans, Mexican kids. And they were all put in one classroom because there was no bilingual classes back in the days. The teachers didn't speak Spanish. So you see, you see, you had this picture of all the kids and you saw kids that were like nine year old, 
10 year old, 14 year old, 12 year old. And so they were all grouped in the same classroom. And it's kind of interesting, you know, these photographs. That's why, you know, it's good to, you know, maintain all the historical thing because I think it tells you, tells you a story. So, so back, back in those days, uh, you know, like, how do, you, how do you get, you know, so you were not really talking about going to college, you know, you just lived the time. You just didn't know where, what was gonna be, you know, your parents couldn't talk to you about college because they, they, they didn't attend college. They didn't even finish high school or even went to probably third, fourth and fifth grade. So they were not talking to, the school counselors were not talking to us about going to college or being educated. So I think that the timing of us growing up was kind of an interesting timing because, you know, this is a time when the, the whole country is going through a whole change. You know, this is like, you know, it's kind of like the life of Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X, you know, becoming a, an addict, becoming a ex-con, coming out and being exposed. And, and you get you get these like uh, uh, consciousness that, you know, that you develop as a result of all, everything that gets exposed. And so, you begin to get you begin to get introduced to the the situation of you thinking that because you're poor and you're uneducated it's your fault. But in reality, when you start analyzing and you start looking at it, there's just there are reasons in terms of why conditions are the way they are. So here's an opportunity all of a sudden to provide young people. And you know when you're young, you're invincible. You don't. I mean that's what I'm saying that right now. I'm 71 years old. You know my energy level is like flat. But a lot of the young people, the young energy between 19, 20, and 30, it's like an invincible energy. And you know, there's nothing you cannot do. So, you know, basically you 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 grow up in a neighborhood and all of a sudden you start reading books and you start talking about people like PD Thomas with down those mean streets. You 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 start reading the story of Malcolm X. The whole civil rights movement begins to open up your mind. And, uh, and you start talking about fighting the system and you start, you know, looking at, you know, influences, you know, people like which what happened with the young lawyers was uh, the whole, the whole influence of the Black Panther Party uh, with Chairman Fred Hampton and, and uh, him joining forces with Cha Cha and some of the other folks. And actually that in a way kind of brought, uh, created this, this whole consciousness within me and within a lot of us to continue fighting for, for our community. And then, you know, we actually began to see what was going on, you know, with the exception of my family and maybe the Medina family and maybe a couple of more families, their own property, everybody else was beginning to move on because, you know, what was happening was, and, you know, the struggle for housing and the struggle for survival in Lincoln Park is a, it's a long history. It's not, it just didn't happen in 1960. You know, the haves and the haves not have always been fighting with each other in terms of, you know, creating, you know, cause the, the, the West End of, of Lincoln Park was kind of like the most neglected because that's where most of the working class people were. That whole Clive One Quarter was done by industry, the Finkel Steel Mill, all that area was, you know, a lot of working class. And so there's always been a struggle. And so, and, and when we begin to see that, uh, that, you know, you, you had neighborhoods that were buildings where we were living in, and some of these buildings were owned by white, white individuals who lived and moved to the suburbs who actually came into raise to pick up the rent and didn't do no repairs or anything like that. So then, they, you know, the buildings would fall apart. And then they would kind of blame us that, you know, oh, don't rent to those Puerto Ricans because they bring roaches, they destroy property. But in reality, the property was already run down. So you get a group of people with a little money uh, to come in and actually buy property they fix it up and then they raise the rent and that began to become a pattern. And so given, you know, it was all timely, you know, with the pattern of the, the rehabbing and the uh, rehabilitation of property. And then the whole movement of, uh, of anti, uh, you know, anti-racism and the whole bit of, you know, with the Panthers and the progressive agenda, that kind of set off the whole thing. And, uh, that's where you know I actually got. As a matter of fact, an hour before um, I actually was going to come on, I actually found something that was kind of interesting, which I wanted to read to you guys. And this is something that someone shared uh, with me on Facebook, uh, and it was uh, it's, it's a it's a 
It's a remark by Justice Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, and it says, if you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside yourself, something to repair tears in your community, something to make life, make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a, meaning, a meaningful life is, living not for oneself, but for one's community. And that's why I picked up all, you know, that's why I got exposed to uh, fighting not only for myself, but also for the community. And I always took that with me everywhere I went. I was always fighting, you know, for those behind me, you know. And so uh, that's where the, you know, my whole community activism began back in the, back in the day, you know, and the exposure of, you know, being involved with the Black Panthers because back in the Young Lords, because back in the days we were all there, but uh, a lot of us, you know, a lot of us were, were kind of struggling. There was a lot of things that were going on in the community. You know, all of a sudden you begin to see drugs coming into the community. So it's an issue that we don't talk about it, but it was a reality. There was a lot of guys, you know, including myself and, you know, a whole bunch of us, that, you know, that we were, do, we were doing drugs. We were doing hard drugs. We were doing all kinds of drugs. But then, you know, we actually developed this, this whole movement came about and a lot of us cleaned up. A lot of other brothers did not make it. A lot of other brothers, they perished along the way. So some of the ones that did make it, we're still fighting because, you know, we believed in it and uh, have always, you know, been involved. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I, will, I will say that we can move on to the next question. Um, and something that I wanted to discuss with this uh, question is, I'm gonna talk pretty much from my experience from, I'm from Colombia and pretty much since I moved here five years, six years ago, um, I think that the experience about black culture, it was very different to what I experienced in Colombia. Um, I will say that I was more cultural shock to see the awareness of the black culture here and to not be aware that I was not being included um, somehow in my country or not thought about it because even when my dad is black, he's like, I was not even like allowed just to say anything that was black related to my family because it's like I've been denied, we're denying that in the Latino community somehow. So I would like you just to kind of talk about it or just discuss about that activist in a community organization in the Chicago Latinx community and how was your experience since you when you moved from your country to here to the United States and how has been like that uh, transformation or cultural shock that many of us call? It's, it's an interesting question because of the fact of, you know, how do you develop your consciousness about race and basically you got to live it, you know, like, you know, I, I tell people the story about, uh, I, I didn't have a Puerto Rican girlfriend until I was 21 years old. And that was because I used to love all, you know, I was like the only black kid, black Puerto Rican kid among all the, all the other Puerto Rican kids. I was one of the few, one of the darkest and the blackest one, right? So I would love all these like beautiful young Puerto Rican young ladies. And I would say, oh, you're beautiful. So there was an experience where I had one, I think it was fourth or fifth grade where uh, there's a young lady by the name of Maria. And Maria, I, I, I wrote Maria a love letter. Hi, Maria, I like you, I think you're pretty, blah, 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 blah. You know, some of this, nothing graphic or anything like that. So Maria went and she gave the, 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 the note to the teacher. The teacher uh, actually told me, you should pay more attention to your, your classwork then, instead of actually doing, sending you know, love letters to young ladies. And by the way, bring your father to school. I want to talk to him. So when my dad came to school, he actually, the teacher went in the, in the hallway. It was Maria, uh, my father, the teacher and me. And she made me read this letter in front of all, all three of them. And so it's my telephone. So um, I thought that my dad was going to kill me when I got home. I said, my dad is going to kill He's going to give me a hundred cocodazos, you know, for misbehaving. And it turned out he didn't say anything. I think he told my mom, the kid is going to be okay. He's got good taste. So he's going to be okay. Just not worry about him. But, but you know, my, my whole thing with the whole thing with racism with, within our own community has been one where I actually have gotten involved 
because of the fact of of of, of not uh, justifying our presence. You know, there's not you know the there's been a denial within the Latino community about the black presence, and that's why you know I got involved. Both has gotten involved with the whole issue of trying to make sure that we are aware that there is a black presence, an African influence presence in, in our own culture. So, you know, in Colombia, you know, Colombia probably has like almost half of their population is black, just about. You know, you got places like I think Choco is one place where basically it's all black. So, so, so you know, you, you come in and, and you realize that. Uh, for some reason, when I turn on the TV, all the people that are seeing TV, none of them look like me. And so the history is there. You just have to look for it. And what, you know, that's what I started doing. I started looking at it. I started uh, talking about it uh, and, and, and realizing. But the other thing is that, you know, there's also this relationship with African Americans and, and Afro Latinos in this country. And the relationship goes way back to, uh, for example, you know, there was like the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, there was a, uh, it was a regiment of uh, African-American soldiers that fought in World War I. And there was a gentleman, a musician by the name of James Reese Europe, who actually put together this great band. And he took the band to Europe to play for the soldiers. In that band, he had about, he went to the Caribbean, he recruited six, several Caribbean musicians, especially Puerto Rican musicians, to play with his band. Members of that group from Puerto Rico was a famous uh, composer by the name of Rafael Hernandez, his brother and his cousin and, other, and others. And the reason why he recruited people from Puerto Rico is because Puerto Rico has some great musicians because they had this system of, it was called Solfeo, which was teaching you about how to do, uh, how to read and how to learn how to music without playing an instrument for two years before actually touching an instrument. So there were some great Puerto Rican musicians there. And not only that, being that there was Puerto Rican was a port, there was a lot of different music that's being played. So James Reese Europe actually created this relationship. The whole relationship with, you know, with Latin, Latin jazz, with uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Chano Pozo. Chano Pozo being Cuban, Dizzy Gillespie being African-American. Chano didn't speak English and Dizzy didn't speak Spanish, but they created music together which is kind of like an interesting situation. And so there, you know, there's a lot of stories like that of, uh, I mean, I grew up in the best world. I, you know, in my house, we'll be listening to uh, Paso Dobles, we'll be listening to uh, Cha Cha Cha, Rumbas, whatever. But outside my house, in the streets, I'll be listening to The Temptations, The Supremes, and uh, anyone that came along. So there was a good cultural exposure for me as a young man. But my whole thing was this whole presence, the denial of the presence of, of Afro-Latino or African, African influence in our music. And that's the reason why I got involved with their project called Kalinda at one time or another. So I don't know if, if that answered the question or not. Sorry, sorry, I, 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 got, I was trying to talk, but I got muted. Um, thank you so much for that. I think that's very meaningful. Um, especially when um, we as Latinos were kind of trying just to understand these whole issues. And, and yeah, it, it's, it's something that I, I guess we need just to be more um, aware of it and look for it. Um, so I guess my, my following question will be, um, can you discuss uh, the catalyst that incited you to the interest as well of your time with Project Kalinda in funding the Puerto Rican Arts Alliance, Cuatro Festivals, Cuatro Festivals, and in being the chairperson of the Afro-Latino Institute of Chicago, have been that experience for you? And like, how do you think um, you have been including or like you actually have been working or the change that you have been actually uh, working for the community as well? Well, you know, by, by the time that all these projects came along, I, <clears throat> I was already a veteran already in, in terms of dealing with issues of social justice. Uh, you know, going from, um, as a matter of fact, getting my college degree, I mean, I, I, I went to UIC, I got a master's and a BA, but I definitely was not gonna be a teacher. I got uh, a degree in elementary education. So I knew that teaching was not gonna be for me. So 
I think after I finished like my undergrad on Friday and on Monday, I started law school at DePaul. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't make it at law school either. There was, I spent like a year and a half at law school and that was not for me. So then I went and I tried to get a, a master's degree uh, at UIC in criminal justice so then I could return back to law school because I was always trying to figure out a way, what is the best way that I could actually help my community? You know, maybe by getting a law degree, I could maybe get involved because before that, I was a, uh, we had a program in the community called the Criminal Defense Consortium. And we had an office on Northern and Western. And basically what this program did is it did the same job that the public defender job did. But the only thing is that we would take people, clients from the community and we would provide them with a social worker and an investigator. And we provide them with the best legal defense possible. And this is a project that lasted two or three years. Uh, so by the time that, uh, you know, the Project Kalinda and the Puerto Rican Ice Alliance, I actually had shifted gear into doing cultural preservation, you know, because to me, that's also very important, cultural preservation and also community, you know, empowerment. So the, the Project Kalinda was a project where I had, prior to that, I had actually, again, worked in the whole issue of social justice working with the Equal and Employment Opportunity Commission enforcing uh, uh, anti-employment anti discrimination and civil rights you know, to people uh, under federal guidelines. And so and then I also became the affirmative action officer at the Chicago Public School. But then I decided to shift gears and go into the cultural thing. And, and I was hired, Project Calenda was an interesting project. It was the project that was launched by the uh, Center for Black Music Research at Columbia College. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to explore the possibility of the connections of all the music of the Americas in terms of its black influence. And I will tell you that mostly all of the music of the America, every country that had, every, you know, the whole word Kalinda meant a universal African dance. So every, every country, Cuba, Puerto Rico, they have a Kalinda dance, you know, the bomba, whatever, every country had a Kalinda dance. And so, a lot of the, the Africans that came actually brought their music, you know, also to dispel the whole myth that a lot of people think that, you know, all these Africans came and they were brought from Africa and uh, they didn't know that there was like hundreds of different ethnic groups, different languages, different culture, different music. The, you know, some of these Africans that came, they couldn't speak to each other because they didn't know each other's language. So those are the kind of things that, you know, in terms of overgeneralizing, what Africans were about, you know, there's, uh, you know, and most of the, a lot of the Africans that were brought to the Americas came from West Africa. So, you know, Africa is a large, one of the largest continent in the world. And uh, so we got most of the Africans that came to the America came from a particular, you know, region like Benin, Nigeria, and some of the other countries that make up the West Africa. And so, yeah, that Project Calenda was one of those. The Puerto Rican Ice Alliance, again, I started that, you know, I was one of the founders of that group because of the fact that uh, I wanted to do something for artists, right? And one of the things that, uh, that I kind of felt is that every time in our community, uh, we would have, you know, uh, an event that had to do with culture. Most of these events were either done by an organization that actually were influenced by some kind of political orientation. And so before you went to see uh, if you went to see an, to to an event, you would probably have to hear a status report from the secretary of the secretary. And he would tell you, spend like 30, 40 minutes giving you a report. And so you're saying, I thought I came to see an, a musical event or cultural event. I end up listening to someone, you know, giving a whole a political speech. And so to me that, you know, a lot of people were not going to, you know, support and see these cultural events for the sake of cultural events. So I decided that, you know, it would be nice to actually form a group that would actually just be strictly about music, about culture. So if you went to an event, all you were going to get was basically, if it was going to be the cuatro, that's all you're going to be hearing is about the cuatro and limit all the other participation that other people were getting involved. So that was it. Out of the Puerto Rican Ice Alliance, I actually started the, the Cuatro Festival with uh, kind of like $100. And there was part of, a, of, a, of an initiative with the Puerto Rican Cuatro Project. 
and also uh, some other local musicians. And, uh, and that was it. And then the, Afri the Afro-Latino Institute was actually already late, you know, in 2006, 2007, where we kind of felt that it would be great to actually have an institute that we could actually begin to create uh, events and programs that would actually educate people about the African presence in the Americas, especially the African presence in the United States and the, in the relationship between, you know, Africa, you know, African Americans and Afro Latinos, and just like you know, in general. So I, I, yes. I, I just turned off. You know. <laughs> no, that's great. Now that you're mentioning the last part, when you're saying that relationship between African Americans and the um, African Latinos of the Black culture uh, in the Latino community. How do you think we can just kind of get together? Uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an interview from, I'm sorry, from the uh, Puerto Rican Arts Alliance. Um, I forgot the name of the person who did the interview, but she was actually saying something that when Black Latinos and African Americans, they kind of meet together, there's always this sense that the Black Latinos are not enough in to be part of the Black uh, African American culture. So when I read that, I was very interested in, I think I have the opportunity right now, now that you have a lot of experience and you have been contributing a lot to our community, how will be that perfect moment of that coalition between those cultures that they can meet each other and just like get to know each other more? Well, yeah, like I said, I, I, I think I mentioned to you that this whole relationship between Afro-Latinos and, and African-Americans have always existed uh, with, uh, you know, with, with uh, I think I gave you the example of, you know, Chano Posto and, and, uh, and there, are, there are others. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, one of them that I was gonna use was the, the whole issue of uh, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, uh, which is Schomburg has the, the, the Schomburg Museum in New York. It's the Museum of uh, African uh, History and Arturo Afonso Schomburg was Puerto, Black Puerto Rican, born in Puerto Rico, came to New York at the age of 20. And Arturo Afonso Schomburg had the largest collection of African artifacts of anyone in the world and eventually became part of the New York uh, public library system. So, you know, we we're also part of the, uh, of the Harlem Renaissance and, and back in the days with, with Marcus Garvey and all those, uh, the, the whole Harlem Renaissance back in the days. So, you know, the relationship has always existed. I mean, I don't think that, uh, that you know, that even, even this, this whole notion that, that, that what you just mentioned about that, uh, that the, 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 the Blacks feel that we're not part of it. In reality, that relationship has existed. You know, there is, is, there's been some separation because of the fact that sometimes, you know, and I would have to say this, that uh, Latinos, you know, want to be counted as part of, of a, of a, want to be part of a pro. Of a, see, the, the, the black community has always had a, a history of, a, of confrontation, a history of fighting for the rights, a history of trying to survive and exist for hundreds of years. And so, you know, you really have to understand and respect that, that historical thing. And, you know, I don't think that that situation is really happening in Latin America with the black presence because of the fact that. Uh, you know, the, you know, we haven't experienced, you know, situations like Jim Crow laws and the whole situation of how Black Americans have been treated for, you know, hundreds of, you know, of years. And so basically, uh, to me, there's always been a, re a good relationship between, you know, uh, African Americans and, and Puerto Ricans and, and, and others. So I, I, I would have to, you know, speak on, on my own personal experience. Like I said, in my family, I have uh, two of my sisters marry African Americans, and so I have nephews and nieces that are half Puerto Rican and half African American. So the relationship has always been there within my own family. And, and if I was to speak on behalf of my family, the relationship between African Americans and Afro Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican has always been good and has always been there. Perfect. Thank you so much. One last question for you before we wrap up this event. I should have brought some water with me, but that's okay. I'm drying out. <laughs> I should. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
This comes from John Ziegler. How are you? Oh, John Z. Okay. How are you received in the Latino community when you self-identify as Afro-Latino? How do I do? I mean, I think I'm having problems with my hearing, but no. I, I'm sorry for to keep telling you to repeat that question again. You're I, fine. All right, I'll repeat it again. Uh, he says, how are you received in the Latino community when you self-identify as Afro-Latino? Well, you know, it's, I really have never really looked into that, but you know what, I've, I've been doing it for so long that, uh, I mean, I really don't get any, any flat from people saying that I'm Afro Latino. Uh, at one time, there was one time, you know, where people would tell you, including my dad, and a lot of old, other older Puerto Ricans would uh, tell you, they would actually, you know, I, I would get into this thing where they would actually feel that they were better than African Americans, even though they're black Puerto Ricans and they were black, uh, that they feel that they were a little better because they spoke a different language. No, we're different because we speak Spanish and, and you know, so that makes us a little different. And in reality, uh, and then, you know, you probably had the same situation in African Americans saying like, you know, those people don't even speak our, our language. Well, you know, why, why are they here? Why are they calling themselves black? But with me, uh, I never really felt any flat with identifying myself as an Afro-Puerto Rican, you know, and, 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 uh, and I don't know if that answers the question. I think that my mind is, getting dry by this time. So John had to come up with that last, last question. Uh, me and John Ziegler, we go way back, way, way back, so. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we really, we actually appreciate, I'm just gonna start just, to, uh, um, well, I'll actually finish a little bit saying that for more information about the Egan House, uh, about the Egan office, just please um, write, <laughs> This is the way that I do it. It's the easiest way. Just go into write in the Google search Egan office and you're gonna find this is the way how it looks on the uh, Google and this is how our website looks. Um, we also have um sorry, we also have uh Quatrix that I'm gonna actually um um a questionnaire that I would like you all of you just to fill in and just answer uh, honestly, whatever, like all, give us mm -hmm. the feedback about this uh, seminar. And now we're gonna do our closing remarks. Uh, okay, listen, I, I wanna thank, you know, John and the Egan Center and all you guys, you know, for working on this thing. It's kind of interesting working with young people and actually trying to say, every time you ask me a question, say what? <laughs> and it's kind of interesting what, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the young perspective and, and, and it, it tickles me to death because I, I still remember when I was your age, right? And, uh, and I was like, for example, at, at UIC when I, when I got there and I already, you know, I was, I was a veteran already rabble rouser, right? So when I got to UIC, right away says, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the neighbor's movement that we got to go in? And so basically every time that I went somewhere, it was always to open doors and to make sure to keep those doors open. So the rest of the people who come in, so it wasn't just us being let in, and then the clo door closes. At UIC, we got involved. I mean, I was one of those 40 people that got arrested. Uh, we actually took over the president's office and we decided that we we're not gonna move and leave the president's office unless they actually came up with a commitment to maintain and recruit Latino students. And out of that program came this program called LADIS, which is a Latin American recruitment program. And so that came out of, our, out of our manifestation. And so what I'm trying to tell people is that never think that you can, it's, it's too late or, or it's never the right moment, the right time. You just gotta go out there and do it. Find, you know, allies that, you know, groups that are trying to do things. There are so many people out there trying to do things on their own and they can use other help. I'm, I'm, one that I'm actually trying to do things on my own is myself uh, with my, you know, with my photographs and my, uh, and my, uh, and my, and my Facebook page because of the fact that I don't necessarily uh, feel that my, my voice as Puerto Rican, my voice is represented by one voice. I mean, I feel that as a Puerto Rican, there's a lot of different voices that make up the Puerto Rican experience in Chicago. And so I think that every voice is important and so that's the reason why, 
you know, my voice and thousands of other voices are important. So there's never, you know, one voice that represents us all. So just make sure that 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 is something that sticks with you at all times. Never let one voice represent you all. There should be as many voices as possible to represent a community. That's it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Carlos. We really appreciate you speaking with us today and just taking some time out of your day just to like really reflect on some things, especially like a topic like anti-Blackness. It's a very heavy topic, and I think it's something that a lot of us really are trying to reflect and really gain perspective on. So we really appreciate you today. Um, we also want to just give a special thank you to Daniela Tovar for leading us in this discussion. She did an amazing job. Um, special thanks to Amy Acosta for putting this together and really organizing this. Monica and John, uh, the director and vice director of the Ian office and also the Stain Center. Um, and any other closing remarks, Daniela, you want to make? No, I think that you said it all. <laughs> um, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Carlos. Like, you don't understand how meaningful this is for us. Um, we have been talking and working on this project. And trust me, every time that we were just working or just even doing research uh, regarding like uh, anti blackness in the Latinx community. We were like finding so much stuff. And I think you tackle every single one of those subjects today uh, on this seminar. And I know you say that you're not only one voice for the whole community, but trust me, one voice is the beginning for many of us. Yeah, so thank as a matter of fact, you guys are filming this thing. I'm probably gonna pull all my hairs if I ever saw this video because I, I sometimes I'm, I'm my worst critic. And I don't know if I really answered some of the questions and it's a very difficult job to be actually be put in a situation where you're being focused and you're being asked questions and uh, to be able to answer. I mean, I could probably, after we leave here, I could probably say, I could have answered that differently. But that, that's, that's what happens, that's what it is. But when I talk about the monolithic voice, I just talk about the fact that I don't want people to think that I represent a whole voice of a community. I'm one of the voices and my voice is just as important as everybody else's. And so that's what I was saying. So I want to thank you guys and uh, and thank John and uh, and uh, and all the folks that were involved with this. And I uh, wish you all the luck in the world in terms of continuing your project. Uh, and uh, anything that you need or anything you need from me, just just feel free to call. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today again. Please do not forget to fill out or just to complete the survey. I'm gonna post the survey again uh, in the chat just in case. Can I, say, more, more, can I say one more thing before I leave? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, uh, basically, I, I think that uh, there was something that, that, that I actually shared with the, with the folks last week. Uh, what is uh, the Amy, with Amy <clears throat> last week uh, on October 19th, the, the Museum of Public uh, Public uh, Housing launched a project called uh, uh, Lincoln Park uh, Fire Fire Identifier. And it's a walking tour that actually is online that actually talks about Lincoln Park and it features uh, my photograph and my the work. And it's a history of the Puerto Rican, of the, of the, of the presence in Lincoln Park in the 1970s. And you could actually do the walking tour and it's made up of visual and audio. So I thought that there would be something that uh, people may want to follow up to see and check out after, after checking this out. So I, cause I didn't mention it before and it's become a kind of like an exciting project where you could actually walk the neighborhood in Lincoln Park and, uh, and do the audio and the visuals of, uh, of, of the history of that neighborhood. Carlos, we have the information. We will be um, very happy to share um, all oh, yeah. about fire, fire, gentrifier with our audience. So thank okay. you very much, Carlos, for, um, thank for your you time guys. today. And wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what, uh, Carlos, I wanted to, to let you know uh, that uh, we had um, audience from Colombia and from Mexico. Ah, my friends. In Colombia, Choco, yeah, you know, like I, you know, the reason I learned about Choco is because, you know, 
basically when we formed this Afro-Latino Institute, we got all kinds of Afro-Latinos coming from all over. And there's a, there's a woman by the name of Eunice Escobar, who actually is an Afro-Colombian, very active in, 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 the, in Chicago and also in the, and so she, you know, she comes from that section and, and that's how I learned about that particular area in, 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 in Choco. And then, you know, the whole issue of Veracruz and some of the, the guapangos and some of that, the African, the Mexican music that actually is also of, uh, you know, has African influence in it. The guapangos is one of them. And uh, so, yeah, greetings to everyone. And uh, wish everybody luck. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much to everyone. Bye. Bye.